Hi, good evening. My name is Kim Dwyer, and I am joined with Kate by Kate Moyer, um, and this is Mindful Moments. So I'm so happy you're joining us tonight. If you're joining live or if you're watching the replay, we're glad to have you here. And we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about mindfulness, um, and I'll share a little bit about Kate. Um, <clears throat> Kate is a yoga therapist and a somatic practitioner in Nashville, Tennessee. Kate felt called to serve those who wrestle with unresolved trauma and constant mental battles. Since she completed her yoga instructor training and yoga therapist certification in 2014, Kate's heart for helping others led her to pursue further education in trauma-sensitive trauma yoga and complementary modalities. Kate has completed training in mindfulness-based self-compassion through Dr. Kristen Neff, and she studied the SOM-X method, a somatic experiential healing program designed for individuals affected by trauma. Kate believes that no matter what you're facing or what you've walked through in the past, you can find healing and peace for your mind and body. So welcome, Kate. We'll be, we'll be talking more about mindfulness. So I'll share a little bit about me um, and why I'm doing this. So I am a clinical psychologist, author, and business consultant um, in Denver, Colorado. I'm also uh, just recently published uh, Mindful Mondays, which is what we're why we're kind of getting together and talking. Um, so Mindful Mondays is a book with strategies. Um, I, I tried to write easy to use everyday strategies so that mindfulness no longer has to be this fancy sit on a cushion for 30 minutes, but just an everyday part of um, everyone's life because I think that's where the value really is in it. So, so we're glad you're here. And Kate, I'm so glad you're here tonight. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk about something that I'm very, very passionate about. I'm so excited that you're putting this beautiful book into the world, making, like you said, something that can maybe feel a little more overwhelming, just really accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Kate, tell us a little bit about, about your company, Mindful Living, and how you came to create that. Yeah, so I have been teaching just traditional yoga since... Goodness. I always like forget how many years because like it kind of seems forever, but I think since 2005, 2006 and just through my own mind body healing journey, I really moved away from the physical um, focus of yoga and kind of came more into the stillness piece, the meditative piece. And then through that really, um, just did some research on the benefits of mindfulness and how it helps with stress and uh, so many different things and really mm -hmm. kind of took my focus in that direction. Um, yeah. And just most of the people that I would be dealing with were struggling with anxiety, depression, and just a lot of mental health issues. And so reading the research and really seeing how it was helping um, my students. And then eventually when I went into my own practice, my private clients, I was like, okay, this is really where I want to focus. This mm -hmm. feels like not everybody can do yoga, maybe because of physical limitations, but everyone can practice mindfulness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm always struck when I, when I'm working with clients and teaching them about mindfulness and how to use mindfulness um, and kind of the, the, I guess you call it like the philosophy behind why bringing our attention back to the present moment is so powerful. I often have people say to me, gosh, why don't we teach this to kids in schools? You know, like, like it's almost like the, uh, a little bit of an owner's manual for having like a human brain and a human body and like figure out how they all work together and get out of the future, get out of the past and come back to right now. And if you're going to be in the future, you know, don't worry, like plan, like be mindful and intentional about how you do it so yeah. that it's not sucking you out of, you know, the moment where you could be enjoying what you're doing and yeah, and not trying to multitask. Well, I think it's really hard. And I mean, I don't have kids, but just the friends that I have that have kids, I feel like, you know, the further along we go, the culture is so focused on like goals and fast and do more and be more and have more. And so that's very focused on the future. And it's like, like you said, the present moment gets lost and is almost like invaluable, <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. being still and being present seems like from a cultural perspective, like we're wasting time. <laughs> yeah. Like it's a luxury, right? Like if you can yeah. not be 
productive and go, 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 go. Yeah. yeah. And yet, you know, we look at what happens when we are in that go, go, go mentality and we're not, you know, we're not being intentional about sleep and nutrition and exercise and like, you know, the care and feeding of a human body, yep. we're going to wind up you know, like not as productive, out sick, you know, immune system issues. Like we know sleep is so tied in with like every physical function, every emotional function that we have. Um, and not that mindfulness is necessarily about sleep, but like if we can, you know, manage to stay in the moment, manage our stress levels better by, by bringing our focus back to what we have control over right now, which is what's right in front of us. And that's, that's pretty much it. Right. Absolutely. And I think honestly, the whole sleep thing is, is part of it in the sense of mindfulness invites us to stay connected with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I really think that is, you know, where we're seeing the busyness and the, you know, working however many hours in a week and not taking care of ourselves and not getting them sleep. It's, it's all symptomatic of being very disconnected when our body is clearly telling us, Hey, I'm tired, you know, and, and, or I'm hurting, I'm in physical pain. And we just push past that. I, I do think even the sleep thing is really about a disconnection with ourselves. And when we're mindful, which is about being present, then we're able to go, oh my gosh, I feel exhausted. Exactly. I didn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much power in even just like stopping and asking yourself, what, like, what do I need right now? Like, what's my body telling me? What, what feels uncomfortable? What feels hungry or thirsty or itchy or like antsy and I need to move, you know? And, and when we are so kind of goal focused, those needs can get really shoved onto the back burner you know, to our disadvantage. Absolutely. And I mean, that's such a good point. Like I always say, I tend to see the people when they've been ignoring their selves, whether it's body or mind or spirit far too long, whether, you know, I taught at an addiction recovery center for six years, or I have someone come in and they're in just absolute chronic pain because they've been ignoring that back twinge for the last five years and finally their body's like okay no more <laughs> yeah. so yeah. i honestly want to get the message of mindfulness like your book in everyday life and then like my you know mission mindful living with kate because it's preventative exactly exactly yeah and and some of the um you know, the complaints I might hear is like, I just don't have time, you know, to sit and meditate and I get bored and I can't do it. And it's, you know, I, I always make the distinction between formal meditation and informal meditation and formal meditation might be when we do sit or lay down or whatever, you know, or during yoga, like Shavasana, like we do be still and really focus on directing our attention. And then we're in, in my practice anyways, we're using that time to train to train the brain basically to pay attention and to direct attention back to the present moment, to let go of judgment, to experience maybe at a level below language, you know, just to experience sensation. Um, and that's the formal, which is practice <laughs> for the rest of your life. Right. Because when you're out there living your life, you're not going to stop because you're stressed and sit on a cushion, but you're going to maybe take one breath and reconnect and, yep. you know, get out of the, uh, catastrophizing maybe that's going on in your head and come back to what's going to really be helpful to me right now. Yeah. And it's that simple, you know, in practice, but like that, the more formal practice makes it easier to get out there and do it. And, you know, when life is coming at you hundred miles an hour. It is. And I love that you said practice because, you know, I hear the same thing like, Oh, I don't have time. And I don't know why, but I think like, okay, what if you convinced yourself you didn't have time to brush your teeth? <laughs> like that wouldn't go over well a year <laughs> later, two years later, three years later. You know what I mean? And I'm not trying to sell meditation. It's not, not like I get some kind of like, you know, mystical kickback or anything, but. You're not an affiliate partner of the universe. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
No, but like, it's very much connected to our nervous system. So mm -hmm. when the stress level is up here, mm -hmm. and again, my hope is that you don't start when it is, this is preventative, but right. when your stress level is up here, you have two minutes, you have three minutes, yeah. you know, just like if your teeth start falling out, I bet you'll find some time to brush your teeth. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And hopefully you'll do it well before your teeth are falling out. Exactly. That would be awful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just that, like to piggyback on what you just said that, you know, our nervous system gets activated. We go into sympathetic nervous system arousal, which is fight or flight response. The best way we can reset that the one piece of that entire fight or flight response that we have uh, voluntary control over is our breathing. So coming back to the breath, you know, sends a signal back to the brain. Okay, she's okay. She's breathing. She's got this. Simmer down. We're going to be good. You know, and it, it quickly reverses all of that agitation, activation, everything that's going on when we get stressed. Absolutely. Honestly, like I don't teach public classes anymore, but I did for over 10 years. And the number one thing, no matter what type of yoga I was teaching, whether it was a very physical active practice or it was a more stretching relaxation practice over and over and over. I kept saying, okay, remember to breathe, breathe in, breathe out. I mean, I kind of feel like I said it every five minutes and so many people over the years would be like, oh my gosh, thank you. I totally forgot. I literally wasn't breathing until right. you said it. Right. And even though you said it four times in class at the end in Shavasana, I was holding my breath and it's, Again, because most of us are in that stress mode, yep. which again, shortens the depth of our breath. It mm -hmm. kind of cuts our oxygen intake and we breathe very shallowly unconsciously when we're in that sympathetic arousal. So right. it's so simple, right? Like, oh, take a breath, but an intentional breath is worlds of a difference than just that unconscious shallow right. um, exactly. breath, which almost kind of replicates the feeling of like suffocating, like you can't get enough breath in which, you know, precedes panic. I mean, exactly. our mind and our body are so intricately woven and intelligent and just that little bit of awareness that when we, like you said, breathe from our diaphragm, it automatically like synchronizes our body's calming response, the rest and digest. I mean, it's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about the ABCs of happy that you created. Oh, I would love to. Um, I know I'm like, oh, I should have had one. <laughs> so, Honestly, I love this story. I really do because it was real and it was true. I had never written anything. I mean, I was a songwriter, but like not, you know, I never planned to write like something like tangible. And just over the years, students would come up to me after I would be teaching again, a class or a meditation. And they'd be like, what's that thing you said about, you know, I don't know, whatever, staying present. Okay. I'm like, what thing? Cause I was in the moment, I was just teaching in the moment and they'd be like, well, Hey, what's that thing you said about breathing today in today's class? And I had no idea. And honestly, I'm a pretty deep sleeper. I never remember my dreams. And I think I must've been like thinking about my students constantly asking me and me never really knowing what to tell them. And so the ABC is unhappy came to me in a dream. It woke awesome. me up in the middle of the night. And like, I promise that doesn't happen. And I remember thinking, I need a place to put all of the things that I say. I should put them in a box. I should call them the ABCs of happy. And I must have been coherent enough to like put notes in my phone. And I went back to sleep and I woke up the next morning and I was like, I think I was like writing in my phone and then I saw it. Now, you know, this is not a Disney movie. And then poof, you know, ta -da! no, I mean, nine months later. Right. I yeah. Plunge. And so what it is, is it's every letter of the al alphabet has a card A through Z. 
with an intention word and then a very short practice. And the idea is to pick one and really let it be your mindful intention. And I suggest for a month because yeah, my intention, it is a practice. And when we talk about brain, um, you know, neuroplasticity, it yeah. is over and over and over, like you have to kind of stay on it in yep. order to create a new neural net um, because the old stuff has just been in there for a long time, you know, the same thing with habits. Yep. Um, but that's why I encourage people to like really take it and, and practice it. And it's just a way when, when we say mindfulness, everyone's like, what? I don't know what that means. I don't want to meditate. But you can take a little card and they're cute and pretty and put it on your mirror and then just think about that one thing mm -hmm. um, and keep it simple until yeah, you've created a new habit that makes you feel good and you, makes you take care of yourself and pay attention to yourself. Yeah, we say in psychology that neurons that fire together wire together. So if we start activating those things, like then we're starting to lay down new synaptic pathways. And I always think about it like it's like it's like uh, mountain bike tires in the mud, right? First couple of times you go through and the mud is soft, it's not necessarily going to stay there. But over time, you keep digging that. And like if you've seen those ruts on this is very Colorado analogy, I think if you've seen those ruts on hiking trails, like once they're in there, they're in there. Um, and I, yeah, I recommend the same thing in my book. I, I recommend people try a new strategy for at least a week. And I have like a reflection page um, to think about like what worked about it, what didn't work about it. Do I want to continue to use this? Um, and again, very simple. You know, I've got one um, that's, um, I think it's called Mind Your Mocha. So the idea of just use like whatever you drink in the morning, if you're a coffee person or a tea person or even a water person, like use that as a focus of mindful attention you know, the however many minutes that it takes you to drink your coffee, or if you're like me, and it takes you most of the morning, like each time you take a sip, you're returning to yeah. just the present moment experience of the taste, the texture, the temperature, you know, all the sensations related to it. Yeah, I think what's so interesting, and honestly, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I've been doing this long enough that like, I know better. But it's fascinating to me, the default of, oh, I've been practicing for so long and I still feel stressed or oh, don't I know better than this? But I like to kind of think about, OK, you can't go to the gym and like start working out and then you like feel strong and, you know, like you've met your goal and then stop. Like it you have to keep going yeah, keep the practicing. lifestyle and and like we get that on a physical level like well yeah duh if i stopped lifting weights okay then i'm not gonna or whatever it is you do to keep yourself healthy oh if i stopped walking yeah my cardiovascular you know endurance is gonna go down but but i did it for two weeks why isn't it just better right. and in the same way like the mind and the body are connected it's like it is a practice it is it is maintenance but it's so right. worth it you know right. Like right and then i think another another common one is like life is because you put in these practices in place it's not you're not somehow changing the future where life is going to become easier you know that there's suffering like that's a major piece of human existence unfortunately wow. um but it's it's part of the package so the suffering's not going to change, but your relationship to the suffering, the the mental state and the, um, you know, the curiosity and, and all that that you bring to it is going to be different than if you're, you know, actively working to avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, get rid of it, you know, stuff it down, all you know, all that kind of thing. And it's having tools. Like, to me, that's what mindfulness really is. It's just a bunch of different tools that you are gathering. And here's the thing. Some are going to really, really work for you, and some are not. Like, I promise, over all the years of doing groups and having students and classes, like, I came across some people who, if I asked them to focus on their breath, it put them into a straight panic attack. So they would be like... I know breathing is really good for me, but I just, and 
I yeah. said, hey, then then that's not the one we focus exactly. on. Right. How about we focus on grounding? And that really brought them solace and gave them relief. So it's gathering tools along the way, kind of collecting and testing some trial and error until you go, okay, when I feel stressed or disconnected or fill in the blank, when I'm suffering, I know that I have three things, five things, 10 things that I can come back to from my practice Mm -hmm. and know that I can support myself. Yep. Which is a great segue into, we both wanted to talk about some of our top mindfulness strategies, practices, tools, um, et cetera. So real quick, tell us what your top five are. Yes. I mean, it was really hard for me uh, to think of top five, but I I picked five. So yes, the breath. Um, And I just want to say again, it's okay if that doesn't work for you. There's plenty more. So um, grounding, I talked about that. Um, And some people, you know, will take it really literally, like feel your feet on the floor or feel your body against, you know, the back of the chair. And I think that's beautiful. But I'm also, you know, offering, let your body feel and find something that supports you. Like if it's as silly as it is, like hugging a pillow, like let that contact ground your body. Um, So I just feel like grounding can even be your own interpretation of letting yourself physically feel supported, um, Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, that, that is for you. And honestly, one of my favorites is a practice called name it to tame it. And this is specifically for when our emotions feel very, very big and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of research and I won't get into all that, like brain science that says like when we can speak or even write, when we can name something, i.e. I feel anxious right now, or I feel very uncertain or my shoulders feel very tense. It almost kind of takes some of the power Mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Um, It puts you into the prefrontal cortex of the brain and, and it kind of lessens the The (laughs) the weightiness, right? Yeah. Yeah. The bigness of the experience. It's so, it's so helpful. Um, I know I'm like looking at my notes. Um, gosh, this one has been so helpful for me. Um, being, there's lots of different terms for it, but mindful observer, becoming the mindful observer. Some people will say becoming the witness. And that sounds like a weird, but it's the ability to kind of step outside of yourself and kind of look in and then Adding compassion um, is even, you know, a stronger practice, but not being so caught in your direct experience, which can really just pull us in from pers- away from perspective. And so when we're that mindful observer, we kind of stand and watch from the outside, we can still see our true essence and separate that from our direct experience. Like, I am okay. Mm-hmm. What I'm experiencing doesn't feel okay. Whereas a lot of times we identify with, I am an anxious, hot mess. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the mindful observer goes, I am experiencing anxiety right now, but I'm okay. I, um, yeah, I. that's probably been the most helpful for me. I mean, I love name it to tame it, but the mindful observer has also been helpful. Okay. And then I was like looking the body, which is really most of my work. My work is helping people come into their body through feeling Mm -hmm. for so many people is really challenging. So yeah, I can get into more of that, but just learning how to be present in your body is 
Yeah. And I just, I think about um, for myself, I haven't been to a yoga class in quite a while now, but um, usually like going to yoga classes, like that first, you know, if it's an hour long class, that first 30 minutes or whatever of moving and getting the kinks out of my body. And then once everything's kind of like reconnected, like I can actually hear, like I get the best ideas like on my yoga mat. It's like, oh, like whatever's in here is finally like I'm listening. Like I'm just open to like whatever's going to come up. And yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Like once you get reconnected, like you kind of shut down that chatter and can just be present and, and, and feel it. Well, I will share my top five. Mine are a little less, mine are um, a little less strategy ish and more um, kind of broad philosophical, but I'll, I'll chat about them really quickly. Um, returning to the present moment. Like, I think that's like the crux of, of mindful attention. So when we, you know, especially in, in my field in mental health, when we are um, anxious from garden variety stress to an anxiety disorder, it's almost always future oriented. You know, Absolutely. unless you're undergoing a present moment, you know, crisis, trauma, you know, mm-hmm. most anxiety is anticipatory. Um, and a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times there's a lot of negative emotions that are um, past tense, like we're recalling things, we're resentful, we're regretful, we're disappointed. Um, and coming back to the present moment is super powerful. Yeah. Um, generating an attitude of curiosity rather than judgment. I think this is so key in a that. lot of parts of life, but especially in relationships and conflict management, problem solving. Like if you can just be present and hear somebody without going three steps into the future, well, they're going to say this when I need to say that. And then for me to win the argument, I've got to say this thing because I want it my way. If you can step out of that, you know, basically divorce yourself from attachment to outcomes and just be present, like what a powerful gift it is to everybody, to yourself also, but to everybody. Um, turning towards thoughts and emotions without judgment or attachment. So that's uh, fancy words are, you know, mindfulness of emotions with thoughts, kind of thought diffusion, like noticing that I'm having a thought as opposed to I am the thoughts that I have, which I think is really challenging in Western culture. Like I think therefore I am is kind of ingrained (laughs) in in our culture, but like thoughts are just mental activity. Some of it's useful, some of it's not useful. Can you observe it and decide if you jump on, that thought train and go to whatever station it decides to take you to like maybe stop sit on the platform examine it before you like jump on and get taken wherever it's going to take you my favorite um, teacher tara brock says you don't have to believe your thoughts yep um my fourth uh mindfulness piece is practicing acceptance and non-attachment to outcomes i've talked about that a few times so you know the fighting what is, <laughs> it's usually not going to end well for us. You know, I, I, I remember one time I was getting really stressed about um, it was going to snow and I had to drive somewhere and I was going to have to drive in the snow. And that's kind of like my, my activating thing. Yeah. Um, my um, former mentors, current colleagues and saying, you know, that I was stressed about that. And she's like, being stressed about the weather, just, you know, you have no control over the weather. I was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, why am I doing this to myself? If it's going to snow, it's going to snow. And I'll have faith that in that moment, I will make the best decisions I can about whether I go to my place or I cancel my appointment or, you know, whatever. Um, And then finally, my last uh, mindfulness tool that you also touched on is um, using mindfulness to generate compassion towards self and others. And I think once we get out of that judging mind, it's so much easier to be compassionate and to, you know, see that commonality between all humans that connects us. So I know we could keep talking about this all night. (laughs) I want to be mindful of um, time. So how can people connect with you and learn more about the work that you do, Kate? Yeah, I am an Instagram girl. I just am. Um, I do have a Mindful Living with Kate Facebook page, but it just takes what's on Instagram and puts it on that page. That works. (laughs) Um, I... I like to just put a mindful moment, if you will. I love, you know, that's the topic of our conversation Monday through Friday, just to help keep people in that kind of mindset to help um, them, you know, be intentional about this. And then Mindful Living with Kate is kind of where you can find me website, Instagram, YouTube, 
um, email. So I do have a YouTube channel where I'm offering just short practices. Some are body focused, some are breath focused, some are meditation focused, but I really want to make these practices accessible to everyone and anyone. So I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me on all the things Mindful Living with Kate. Wonderful. Yeah. And for people looking to connect with me, um, my website is drkimdwyer.com. Um, I also Dr. Kim Dwyer on Instagram. Um, I have a Facebook um, business page and I also have a community, a Facebook community that's um, more for mental health providers and other folks in relationship-based businesses. Um, that's all listed under intentional private practice. Um, and then through my website, uh, there's kind of a splash page where if you're interested in any of the books, you can click on the books link and that will take you to more information about Mindful Mondays, some additional content. Um, there's a meditation that will be up on there real soon. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from folks who have questions or thoughts or feedback. So Kate, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. I'm really glad that uh, we, we were chatting before this started. I'm glad that the world is such that we can connect with people that you know don't live down the block from us and, and have these conversations because I think so valuable so valuable and thank you for the work that you do and bringing this you know to many many people um get her book everybody <laughs> <laughs> mindful mondays we all need a mindful monday <laughs> absolutely all right thanks kate i hope everybody has a good evening <laughs>